These are the seven takeaways I have from first robotics competition. Hi everyone, my name is Ignacio Ravello and I'm a grade 11 student from Canada who has competed in two FRC competitions. So I have learned quite a bit throughout these competitions and I truly want to help rookies and any teams who are just looking for more insider tips. And these are my seven main takeaways that I have from all of these FRC competitions which I've competed in. Keep in mind, I have only competed in regional rounds, so I am not very familiar with the district rounds where you collect ranking points. However, most all of these tips should apply to any round, so hopefully you can take away from this and your team as well. So the first takeaway that I have is having the robot fully, and I mean fully, fully, fully done before going to the competition. So. If you're a rookie, you're probably thinking about this and you're saying like, what is this guy saying? Of course we're gonna have the robot done before the competition. But trust me, my team was trying to do things, not even before the competition, but literally during the competition. And I'm sure for anyone who's already experienced FRC before, they can <laughs> approve this, that when you get to the competition, you're telling yourself like, oh, we have to do this, we have to do that or there's still so much to do. And a lot of this, while people might say it's because you're not smart, that is not true. It is really just because procrastination, <laughs> the team wasn't fully prepared beforehand and a lot of the stuff was just being rushed. So ensuring that your team is feeling fully confident before even leaving the school to go to the competition, that would make everything so much better. And another thing is that I'm part of the coding team, so I know firsthand the problems that this can create because as coders, we have to try out the code. And a lot of the time, we don't know if the code works or not because we actually can't test it out because the bot has not been fully developed. It's not fully ready for the competition. So by having this issue of not being able to fully have the robot ready, as soon as we get to the competition, A, the code's not even tested, and B, we also don't even have the robot ready. So if we don't actually put significant work and kind of get lucky, because how do you know if you're actually gonna solve an issue or not? If you don't get those two things done, then unfortunately you can't do anything significant, get any good amount of points in the actual games. So that is very important. So the second key takeaway is making sure that the drivers have a good understanding of how to drive the bot, but also just a good feel of the different buttons, the different mechanics, because most of the time, when you're in those high stress situations mid game, you don't want to lose those seconds of panic where the, the driver clicks the wrong button and then the wrong thing happens and you end up losing points and you end up messing your team and the alliance. We have definitely experienced that before. So make sure that everything is set up properly to what the driver wants. That's also very important. If the driver just doesn't really want the feature or wants it set up differently, listen to the driver. If that's your main driver and that's what, the, what he or she suggests, make that your number one priority to make sure that it is completed. And this is especially to the coders. <laughs> This has happened to me a lot of times. The driver's saying, oh, we should set up field-centric drive. And I'm like, what is that? And if it actually doesn't get implemented, then the driver has to sort of relearn it all. And the driver in the end of the day is the one that's suffering. The coder, the builders, isn't really the one who's suffering mentally while watching. Yeah, they can. But the driver's the one who has all the power in their hands. So by making sure the driver feels comfortable, whether the game doesn't go as smoothly as you expected it or the bot, at least if you have a comfortable driver who can do one or two things good repeatedly, you automatically already have a really good mission. You automatically have already a really good idea and really good way to score lots of points. And that is very important. Now the third takeaway is to know that your robot will not 100% work. Yes, as simple as that, just, just knowing that when you go to the competition, there will be errors, there will be bugs. 
you have to be on your toes and you have to be ready for all issues. And, and I mean all, like really all. When you go to the competition, you have to make sure that you are ready to debug, to fix, to change, to modify. You can't get to the competition and expect everything to work flawlessly, 100%, and just chill, you know, let the driver do what the driver's gotta do. No, you gotta make sure that you can change things, modify structures, game design strategies, all that stuff is really important to be changing. And that also means that speaking with other teams about what their strategies are and modifying yours. And additionally, I'll talk about this in the other takeaway, but every time you play, you're improving. So every time you play a game, you see what's happening and you see what's working, what's not working. And what you could have is you could have a person who specifically analyzes data from other teams. So they're sitting and watching the games and seeing different strategies within teams. That could be helpful. However, if the person who's taking the data doesn't do it to a level, like if they kind of don't fully commit and don't fully actually analyze the games, then it's just not really useful. But if the person actually steps up and, and fully analyzes everything, then that can be very, very, very useful. So you're gonna have to make sure that everything is gonna change. You're gonna have to modify. Just expect it to happen. And if it happens, don't be scared, don't be stressed. Everyone in the venue, 95% of the people in the venue will be experiencing that too, okay? So it's not it's not your team is bad, it's not your team, whatever you wanna, you wanna tell yourselves, it's not true. It'll happen to everyone, it happened to us. So just expect it, don't be scared, and solve the issues face on. So the fourth key takeaway is don't make any big changes to your robot. So like I mentioned before, it sounds counterintuitive, but it'll make sense in a second. Like I mentioned before, you want to consistently update your bot for problems. That's true. If, if your drive isn't working properly, go ahead, by all means, fix it. But there should be a system that you follow, sort of a, a rule of thumb that if this issue that's constantly happening will most likely take three or more hours and will require a certain amount, that amount is really dependable on your team, but make sure you set a guideline beforehand. If it passes a certain amount, three or four hours, or you have to disarm something, or whatever the case may be, just don't do it. You either don't do it, or you just remove it and improve other parts. Pretty much what I'm trying to say is that nine times out of 10, when you have a problem in the bot, and you really just wanna change that whole system or redesign a whole thing, anything to do with designing wise in the competition, just don't do it. It's really not worth it. If you're making minor fixes or fixing motors or any electrical stuff, then sure. But design wise, if the intake isn't working or you wanna change a subsystem, hardware wise, don't do it. Trust me, it is not a good idea. And actually, there are some rules with FRC that you're not actually allowed to bring a certain amount of gear and all that stuff. I'm not fully sure exactly what the rule is, but I remember that a team who was also a rookie team at the competition wanted to change an intake and they changed it. And previously it worked to a certain amount, but it wasn't very high quality. So they're like, yeah, you know what? Let's change it. So they got this huge part from, I think they bought it at Home Depot on the Friday of the competition. So it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday. On the Friday of the competition, they disassembled everything. They got there super early, disassembled everything, had to miss a game because they were disassembling everything. They put on the new part and it didn't work. They, they tried to figure it out. I could see everything. They were all stressing. They created this whole big issue pretty much themselves. Now, obviously, if they had fixed it beforehand, they wouldn't have had the issue in the first place. But once you're in the competition, you can't go to the past, it's done. So do not make that mistake where you have a huge update on your robot. It's just really not worth it. Set up a certain guideline with your team saying that, okay, if, if, if it's a certain amount of time it takes or a certain amount of gear we have to implement or innovation, we just don't do it. And I think that is very beneficial because then you don't waste all the time having to fix all the stuff. And, it'll save you a lot of time. So the fifth takeaway is 
use all the practice games and get as much practicing space as possible. So if you don't know what practice games are or the practice area is, I actually have a whole video going down the ultimate guide to rookies and you should check that out for more info. And also up here I have my vlog so you can see exactly how FRC competition works. But pretty much the way it works is that you have practice games, which are before your qualification games. So you have normally, it was weird because in our first time doing it, our rookie season, we had, I think six or seven practice games. But in our previous one that we just had, we only had three practice games. But anyways, that time is super, super, super beneficial to improving your bot, looking at the flaws and trying out autonomous mode and looking at other teams, how they perform. The truth is that all teams during that time try new things. So it doesn't necessarily matter if a team looks at you and they're like, oh, this team's bad. You can say, oh, we're just testing out a new thing. We have an alternative, we have a backup. Don't worry, we're still a very trustable team because you also wanna build an alliance, but that's beside the point. You want to test things, you wanna try different strategies, try everything in the practice game. You really have nothing to lose because you Ranking wise, you have nothing to lose. Alliance wise, you could possibly lose maybe one or two of the really high ranked teams to get your credibility later. But if you prove yourself in the actual games anyways, I'm sure those teams will forget about the practice games. And keep in mind, a lot of the teams just don't make it to the practice games. So you can wait if you really wanna try different things and see because that's what happened actually in the last one that we had in vancouver and a lot of the teams just kept going especially the high ranking teams they just kept cycling those practice games and yeah it it really is super helpful you'll definitely see as a rookie team you'll see how helpful the practice games you'll be you'll be wishing you had more practice games but then there's also the practice area. Pretty much the way it works is that you have to pass a safety check first. So you're gonna have the safety staff who goes and gives you the thumbs up on your robot. And once you're given the thumbs up, you're given a magnet or in, in ours, we were given a magnet, but you can register your team in the practice area and you can check, check out in the vlog. But in the practice area, two bots can be on at the same time and you're given 15 minutes. And pretty much there you can actually move the bot around and there's replicas of the actual game. So you have places where you can throw, for example, in, in the reefscape, you can throw coral, you can put algae, and there's also hang as well. So there's all that different type of practice, which is really helpful. And the way it works is that it's pretty much first come first serve. So if you put your name or the magnet team number on the spot, then you can obviously go and practice. And it's only 15 minutes. And if, the, if a team doesn't show up, you can take the spot. And if they don't end up making it after five minutes into their 15 minutes, then you can automatically just stay there the whole time that that team lost their spot. So what you can do is you can have someone from your team scouting and watching and checking if teams aren't gonna make it because a lot of time, they don't like a lot of the time i'd say i'd say for the practice games it's higher but for for the practice area where you can actually drive around you could say three out of ten the people who put their spots don't actually able to make it or two out of ten so there's a very high chance that you can make it not very high but the practice games is a lot higher because the teams don't actually register themselves it's it's automatic so the system automatically puts the teams in the games compared to the practice area the team actually needs to manually put a spot there so take that as you will highly recommend utilizing those as much as possible and yeah you will find that a lot of the teams won't even go to any of them because they just can't they don't have enough time the robots not to a high level and also an important thing to mention is for the practice area and your pit so where your robot is in the pit it needs to be stationary of course so you can't move the bot around and in the practice area you can move it around however you have to use a land cable that's just the way the safety it's in the rules you have to use a land cable because when you use wi-fi i think can affect the signals with the actual game that's going on because the game is obviously wi-fi there's no cable there so they tell you to use cable they're not going to penalize you if you use wi-fi but it's important to make sure that you use cable just so you don't get into annoying mess where the judge says you can't practice because you need a ethernet cable so that was the fifth takeaway and now for the sixth takeaway 
is making sure that you are strategizing effectively with your alliance. So if you also don't really know how alliances work, check the ultimate guide. I pretty much have everything broken down in that video, but your team is partnered with two other teams for all of your games because it's always a three versus three. And you really want to make sure that especially the practice games don't matter as much, but for the actual games that you are talking with those alliances and making sure that you each have a certain task. You each know which spot you want to go either left, middle, right. You each know what you're trying to do, what your objective is, what the autonomous mode is. It will help so much more. Make sure you guys have chemistry. It will just make life so much easier the game so much easier everything will work so much better when you actually talk with the alliances and i think that's a really important takeaway is just make sure that you talk with all the alliances and you're properly communicating what your goal is so there's no confusion throughout the game and additionally if there's a bot that can't do too much you can look at the other alliances so let's say out of your three bots one of the bot isn't as effective at doing the more higher tasks and higher difficulty stuff, you can tell that bot to cycle one certain task. So for example, the bot just cycles in, in, Reef, in Reefscape, cycles L1, so just the level one, it just gets the coral and it just shoots it out. And it just does that a bunch of times. And then the other two bots can just forget about doing level one because that one bot can just do it a bunch of times. And those bots do the ones that get the most amount of points and ranking points. So that's really important, especially looking at people's weaknesses, but also their strengths because that bot has a strength that it can cycle that level one. And, and I'm sure that each bot has some strength that you guys can capitalize on. And the seventh and final one, which relates pretty well with six, is to just talk with other teams, whether they're alliance or not, because at the end, they select. Once again, look at the ultimate guide up there on how the selection process works, but a team pretty much selects two other teams. And if you have a really good connection with that team, and let's say they're picking 50-50 between one or the other, which have good skills and ranked pretty well, which one do you think they're gonna pick? The one that they have no idea about or the one that they've been talking to and they helped code and they have a better relationship with, right? Obviously, or most likely, it's gonna be the one that they've communicated with. So it's very important that you build relationships with teams, even though you don't really know much about them. And it doesn't even have to be a fully robotics relationship. You can just talk to them really about anything. And just the fact that you talk to them and actually give interest, and that shows that, hey, maybe we actually have some sort of relationship going and connection, and hopefully you guys can pick us. So that is a very important takeaway from FRC. And I also have a video, all of the interviews I had with people, so you can gain even more insight on the teams that go through robotics every year. So those were my seven key takeaways from experiencing FRC. And hopefully this video helped you. Please comment down below if you have any questions or if you really learned anything that you want to share to the FRC community. Like and subscribe if this has helped you. I really want to share these videos with other FRC teams. And my goal is just to help as much as possible. So let me know if you have any questions. I hope you enjoyed this and I have all my vlogs. Check it all out. <laughs> I don't really know. But yeah, check out my channel for other FRC guides and I will see you in the next one. Bye.